Welcome everybody to the show. If you're finding this on YouTube, uh, know there is a podcast. You can click below and get this on audio only. So you can take us with you on your multitasking of exercising, driving, or whatever you're doing. And if you're on the podcast, know that we are on video and you can come over to jjflazanes.tv to see this conversation and to meet Jill Bolte Taylor. I am so excited to have you on. Uh, welcome to the show. Hi, I'm very happy to be with you, JJ. Thank you. So I saw you on Super Soul Sunday years ago when you first came out with Stroke of Insight. And I don't remember how we got back to now, like why I reached out recently. I think something I saw something or maybe you might have been interviewed or something resurfaced. And I was like, oh, yeah, I want to have I want to have you on the show. And when I was going through your book, it was such an interesting dichotomy. And I don't, and I really would love to speak to this at some point. I, I do want you to tell your story for the people that don't know it in condensed form, which I'm sure you're a pro at. <laughs> but before we get started, uh, I, I teach law of attraction. Uh, I've had Dr. Evan Alexander on the show several times, at least three or four. And hmm. what I find, what I found really fascinating about his story, again, brain st- situations, right, is that his story, and, and this is to say, guys, when you hear Jill's story, don't make that be the end of it. The value of her experience through the book, all of the details, every detail, it will help you really embody the feeling and the experience and the lessons are actually in the story, in the, like the details of the story, not in just here's what happened to me. Because I had I had watched Dr. Alexander on Super Soul Sunday also, and I had had a therapist at the time and she said, did you read the book? And I said, no, I, oh, I know his, <laughs> I know his story. She's like, oh no, no, you have to read the book. And then when I read the book, I was like, oh yeah, you have to read the book. But with Eben, I said, do you realize that you've manifested this? Like the thing that you really yearned for and the thing that you fought against, the thing you weren't open to, the thing you think you knew didn't match. And so you attracted the thing that would teach you what you really wanted to know, even though it went against your sort of left brain linear thinking. And to me, it was a perfect law of attraction story. So when I get into your story and I hear that you're actually excited, you're like, oh, good. I can learn from the inside out. <laughs> I was like, Do you think, I mean, did you have that? Did you have that? Well, first, I guess we need to tell people what happened. You had a stroke, but let's give them the, the Cliff Notes version of your story. Sure. So I, I actually grew up to study the brain because I have a brother diagnosed with schizophrenia. And so as his sibling, he's the closest thing to me that exists in the universe, but he cannot connect his reality, reality to his delusions. And I can. So I grew up to be a neuroanatomist. I study the brain at the cellular level. And my whole interest was in how does our brain create our perception of reality? And it's like, you know, the universe says, be careful what you ask for, little girl. You want to know how your brain constructs reality? Well, we're going to deconstruct it for you. And I experienced, I was 37 years old, teaching and performing research at Harvard Medical School. And I had a major hemorrhage in the left half of my brain. And over the course of four hours, I watched my own brain completely deteriorate in its ability to process information. In the absence of the left hemisphere, I had an untethered right hemisphere experience. And my area of expertise was how does our brain take these two very different ways of processing information at a biological level and end up being a whole human? So I got the the lesson the hard way of losing the left half of my brain. Uh, I sat inside of an absolutely silent mind for five full weeks. And because language is in the left hemisphere. So for two and a half weeks, I had total silence. Uh, I could not walk, talk, read, write, recall any of my life. I was an infant in a woman's body. And then I had brain surgery. And then two and a half weeks later, I finally started hearing the little static of like tuning into the radio again of language. So um, it was a profound experience. And then it took eight full years for me to completely recover everything. Well, that was extremely succinct and beautiful. And I, and what I'm enjoying about, no, that was great about your, about your story. I have this, I'm having thoughts that are beyond, like, I want to have a conversation with you beyond the book because I've read the book, Please. Uh, but, but, and, and we will, but I, but everyone else hasn't necessarily read the book. So I yeah. want to make sure everybody gets the book. So my stroke of insight and what I, you what realize, I realize you realize 
realize, JJ, the reason why we've come back together again is there's a book number two. Yes, that I did see came that. Out. Have you seen that? Okay, we'll get there. I've seen it, but I don't have it. So we can okay. do another interview about what... that book. Perfect. Okay, great. I want to start with Joke of Insight because I'm, so I know you did a little homework on me and you said that you see that I'm helping people with self-care and that's true. And what has happened in the 20 years, well, I've been I've been in business longer than 20 years, but I started out as a personal trainer, but I was an actress before that. So in terms of like left and right brain stuff, I was extremely right brained. And it wasn't until I went, I moved to New York to be the actress. I graduated as a musical theater major. I went to school, I went to work and I wanted to use the other half of my brain. I recognized that that I had this, this, I'd get bored if I wasn't think, figuring something out. Yet I wanted to express myself. I'd feel backed up emotionally if I wasn't doing something expressive. And so I tried to balance that. And I thought, well, the acting piece gets the emotional piece out, but I need something to figure out. So I ended up, and I care about my body. So I ended up becoming a personal trainer. And through the course of being a personal trainer, I learned science. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, I'm smart. Like, oh, my left brain works really well. Like, I'm good at this. Like, I get this. Because prior to that, I didn't think I was smart because it bored me. Math and science bored me because it didn't mean anything. And now when we make it personal and it's my my joint and how it works and my physiology and how it works and the stuff... All of a sudden it's personal and I'm like, oh, I get this. And I, cause I Love see it. mechanically yeah. and it, I, I mean, I must've watched, oh my gosh, I went through exercise physiology so many times and it would get to a certain point. I could get a little more each time and I could, but then I would like brain freeze and I'd like totally zap, like zap out. And at one point the Atom company made a, they, they took mechanics, they took physiology and made it mechanical and they made pictures and colors and all the sounds like, oh, I now get it. I understand action potential to muscle contraction when all those different steps before- <laughs> And, I, and this is, I get to geek out with you about this because I don't, I don't use these words anymore. I don't get to talk like this with anybody, but I'm like, I love this stuff. All, the, all the chemical and electrical yeah. things that happen between action potential and muscle yeah. contraction, when yeah. you draw, when you're drawing with a black and white pencil yeah. um, and you're like cutting the cell and cut, cutting the muscle and cutting the muscle down to the cell. And I'm like, okay. And then you lose it because it's not color and I can't see the differences between the things. And I don't know what's electrical and what's chemical. Anyway. So I, I get that I'm, I have a left brain now. I'm like, Oh, 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 left brain. Smart, smart. Okay. Yeah, and then it. I got, yeah. And needed, <laughs> but what is, but what has happened is I have moved into, but that right brain, right part of my brain has always been, and I'm a Pisces and I've been, uh, I used to think I was really good at communication when I really wasn't. I am now, but I used to not basically just blame people and think I was really good at communication, but like emotional and expressive and dancing and singing and acting and doing all the things. Right. Yeah. And but this whole part of me has always said, but this piece is the most important piece. Yeah. And I have been a personal trainer harping about learning about studying human yeah. behavior from a psychological, astrological, psych- spiritual, epigenetic, quantum physics perspective for 20 years and getting to the place where now that is what I'm doing. So the, I think the reason why we're together now with this, besides the fact that you have a new book is because I want it to, I'm, I'm learning and noticing more how brains work. I have yeah. your book on audio and I'm, I need to get the, the hard copy because you listed all of the different, I don't know if you can, if you can like say this from memory or if you have your book in front of you, but I loved all the different names that you yeah. compared left and right. Like you gave so many more than I'd ever heard. I'm like, Oh my God. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah yeah. 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 Can you share those? <laughs> <laughs> That's book two. You sure you want to go there? Oh, okay. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Fine. But, but I can it, do that. Okay. Let's, let's look at it this way. We'll combine the two books. Okay. So um, the fundamental difference between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere is I exist in the left hemisphere. I, me, the individual, I don't exist in the right hemisphere, the right hemisphere. And one of the biggest myths that we have is that the right is emotional. It's not emotional. It's experiential of the present moment. It's right here, right now. And it has thinking and it has emotion in the present moment, but it really blends into the experience of the present moment, which is boundless beyond me, the individual. 
The left hemisphere comes online and it has language. And with language comes an identity, an individuality, and a group of cells in that left parietal that defines the boundaries of where I begin and I where I end. So I now have a structure, I have an identity, I have language to communicate and organize in the external world, and I have emotions and I have linearity across time, me the individual. So I become me, the individual across time. So anything that happened in the past is in the left hemisphere somewhere. It's not about right here, right now. So the right here, right now, big as the universe, not about me, the individual versus I, the individual have structure of a body and I have linearity across time. These are two completely different ways of existing in the world, and yet we are wired for both of those. And so in the, in the first book, My Stroke of Insight, as I watched over the course of four hours, my own brain break down circuit by circuit, fascinating experience through the eyes of a scientist. Oh my gosh, you know, um, I can't speak. You know, you don't know you can't speak until you try to speak. And we learn about this in a textbook, but what does that actually feel like? What is it like when someone speaks to you and all you get is the roar, 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 but you hear the inflection of their voice. So you're picking up on their experiential and the emotional content of that sound. So my stroke of insight gave me a really clear delineation about what's going on in the right brain, because I became as big as the universe. You have energy on your wall. Of course, this is what you do. Spirit, purpose, energy. Well, that is the consciousness of that right hemisphere. The left hemisphere comes in and says, well, I'm still an individual. I'm a me. And as soon as I'm a me and I'm filtering all information through the filter of me, the individual, everything is about me and my pain from the past and my hopes and dreams and fears of the future and all this data that has everything to do with the external world that has absolutely nothing to do with the present moment. Yes. My favorite descriptors that you said were fluid and solid. <laughs> I was like, I mean, yeah. because as I was listening and you would say fluid and as a, again, Pisces, and I, I, I took a test online once. I don't know how true it was, but it said I was 50% both left and right brain. I, we're all 50% left oh. and right brain. Right. But yeah. I mean, in terms of what, what neurological programming we have active yeah. and what's right. right. Um, but I, I, I just could ease into when you said fluid, I was like, oh. <laughs> I was just like, exactly. Like, that's exactly right, because there's this there's this relaxation of calmness in the acceptance of what am I as a biological organic? It's not now about JJ and her schedule and her details and what she's got to do and what she's been doing, and what she did right and what she did wrong and what's good and bad. And that, 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 that. It's not about all that. It becomes the present moment. So for you to come to your life as a right brain character who's very interested in theater, very interested in the experiential arts, this is this is you coming in as a child recognizing you are in connection with everything and your form of communication then becomes how do i use me to communicate how do i express myself and then the left brain turns on and says oh i can actually learn all those details those details, details, and more details about details. And then my learning becomes, well, the better the teacher, the more clear the teacher, the teacher's got to start at A and go to B and go to C and go to D. And that's a very different teacher than someone who jumps from A to H to Z and then back to L again, you know, because your brain, you're, you think linear with that left brain. And it's like, oh my gosh, I have this beautiful left brain. I actually went through the same thing. I was 20 before I knew I had a good brain. Left brain, because I know it's true. No, I was very artistic and musical and athletic uh, for the first 20 years. And my poor mother was scholastic. And she thought, Jill, are you ever going to turn on the other half of your head? And it was anatomy for me. I fell madly in love with cells and the beauty of these cells in this body. And oh, my gosh. And then all of it, kinesiology and biochemistry and organic chemistry. And oh, my God, it's just so exciting. Anyway, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, what well, was a confidence issue? I think I, you know, when I was compared to in school, 
you know, the straight A geeky math kids. And I, and somehow they got deemed more valuable because they were smarter and could memorize things and take a test that just didn't feel right to me. And so when I, so I judged myself as not being as smart as somebody else or having different kinds of smarts. And then when I got to being a trainer and started learning science, all of a sudden I was like, oh, I can do this too. I, now I understand I do it in different ways. I do it in pictures. So we're talking about the left brain giving you pictures during your recovery. And that's exactly where taking science for me and making it mechanical, giving it color, giving it shape, giving it texture, all of a sudden I can memorize it very easily now because it's not about memorizing. It's about visualizing the process of it. And, but I didn't know how to articulate that back then. And I wouldn't have known how to tell my teachers to do anything differently or the subjects couldn't have gotten any better uh, for me, which is fine, but it gave me a bit of confidence. But then I probably used it too much. I got into the whole masculine, you know, what a competition and, and business and running your own business and the masculine energies of that the left brain provide when you're wanting to be a value to someone else to pay you. And, and, and now getting into, I actually started a certification. I work with cancer patients. I work with people like on the emotional level to try to uh, really process their emotions. And yeah. cause I don't think a lot of people do it very well. Yeah. And so what I would love to talk about, I mean, I want to talk about everything, but one thing that's, that I was, I was, I was hiking before today's, I go every Wednesday and Monday, yeah. my partner, I go for a hike. And then I have my uh, interviews on Wednesdays. And so I, I always go on the hike before the interview. And we're talking about what I was going to talk about with you. And I'm like, gosh, what am I going to talk about with her? Because I go through the book and, and please feel me when I say this, like when I'm reading, I'm like, yep, 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 yep. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Because I'm the person yeah. that started yeah. out as the more yeah. intuitive who doesn't need the proof yeah. that something exists, yeah. but I love learning the science yeah. and I, and, and I'm like, okay, so where, how can we take this into, and you're going through it towards the end of the book. I'm literally like 30 minutes to the end um, about cells and multidimensional circuitry and what you needed. And I, oh, here's a question I have. Because I have so many. Sorry, I'm I'm all over the place. Uh, you were talking about, and I, I'm trying to connect it to what I'm doing, what my what my population listens to, in this conversation yeah. that I this ongoing conversation I have with my podcast listeners and my community. Yeah. It's that having having the use of the left brain versus the right brain and activating that right brain and being able to come to that place and whether it be from different parts of the brain. When you were first going through recovery and you were in the hospital, oh, before I ask that, mm-hmm. what what did they do to stop the bleeding? You did, you skipped over that. You got into uh you got into a room and then you went on to the recovery and talking about the about the surgery, but how did they stop the bleeding in your brain? So, uh, they gave me a steroid. And that's it. And- in the emergency room, yes. Yeah, so steroids will go in and they will decrease the inflammation, take the pressure off the brain and give the brain an opportunity for the bleeding uh, to stop. Usually hemorrhages will kind of run a certain, you know, there's only so much space, they'll get so big. Um, but yeah, they they use a, they just gave me an injection of a steroid. Okay. And because, not- because I clotted and because it stopped, uh, they did not do surgery that day, which is a completely different experience than giving me two and a half weeks to try to get strong again before they t- give me that second really big hit to my head, which is cut your head open. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, when I was listening, I'm always listening for the DIY, not that again, the stroke, I would ever try to DIY. I'm just saying in the case of, I can't get help. <laughs> well, like In the case that I can't get help, I can't get to the hospital. What yeah. could I do to yeah. stop the bleeding? You know what I mean? So that's, yeah. that's where yeah. that question came slow from. Slow down, the- slow down. I had naturally uh, low blood pressure, 90 over 60. Uh, still doing very blessed like that. And if I had had a uh, high blood pressure, I probably would have bled out and died. Uh, if I would have gotten excited and panicked, I probably would have died, bled out and died. Um, so, so it was, uh, you know, I was just, everything just worked perfectly. One of the, I guess, I've had a therapist in the past say, oh, you're two in your head, you're two in your head. And I'm not, and to me, I'm going to, I'm going to make that mean right now you're two in your left brain. Um, and I'm not in disagreement with that, but because I had this newfound love of my left brain, I was like, okay, but it has a point. It's the computer yeah. that, that yeah. can assess what's going on and articulate and, and interpret what's going on in, in a usable way. Let's say, of course, the right brain is going to interpret too differently. Like you yeah. said, one is about not in one's in present moment and one's not necessarily yeah. present moment. And what, and so in the work that I do with people and 
both, you know, it, and with the trainers, there is a component of a lot of sort of an analytical left brain stuff, but we do equal, and I'd like to make it even more, um, getting people into their right brain and exercises people can do, or, and, and I heard you talk through some of this, but where have you come to with, and I, this is probably the new book, but yeah. <laughs> sorry, that's okay. There's going to be more to talk about. Yeah. Um, how, how does one recognize, right. let's, let's back up. How does one recognize which part of their brain they're dominant in right now? Well, you can't recognize that until you know what your parts are. Right. And so part, so I came to the material in book number two because I was giving a presentation and I said, you know, I love talking about the brain now because people know the anatomy of the brain. They know we, we have the amygdala. Fact of the matter is we have two of them. And there was literally an audible gasp in the, in the room. It was like, we have two amygdala, you know, everybody knows we have an amygdala now. Well, not everybody, but lots of people, but we have two amygdala. We have two hippocampi. We have two anterior cingulate gyri. We, our limbic emotional system is bilateral. So we have emotion in the present moment and emotion in the present moment when it's not just about me, the individual is the experience. What does it feel like simply to be in this present moment? So that becomes a character profile that we can identify identify, we can recognize it in ourselves, we can give it a name, and we can embody that character at any time that we want. And we can recognize when we're in that character or when someone else is in that character. So we each have these emotional systems, two emotional systems, and these two thinking modules of cells. So there are actually four very specific characters at a neuroanatomical level that become very predictable. And so book number two is called Whole Brain Living, Whole Brain Living, The Anatomy of Choice, which is what we're talking about, and the four characters that drive our life. And when you have a decision to make or you're feeling conflict or confusion, you can get to know each of these four very specific characters that we all have to varying degrees. And we can get to know better and we can strengthen the ones that are weaker or the ones that are really strong that we don't want. We may want to help figure out how to self-soothe and, and nurture that part of ourselves better. But when we know what our choices are, then it's like, okay, well, in this moment, I want to be a character one. That's my left thinking, rational brain where I interact with the external world. It's my A-type personality. It's my businesswoman. Where does she come out? She comes out in the office. She comes out on the phone. She comes out in podcasts. She gets it done. I call her Helen, short for hell on wheels. She gets it done. So Helen and I, we have a relationship and all of my friends, they know Helen pretty well. So if they call and I'm in the office and Helen answers the phone, she says, hello. And then they speak and I say, what can I do for you? Well, that's a Helen response, right? That's not warm and fuzzy. Let's chat for a while that I'm going to get with my character three or four who wants to actually interact with another human being. So the, that character one, you get to know that part of yourself, give it a name, own that identity, recognize when you're in it, recognize when your partner's in it, recognize when people around you are in it, honor the value structure of what that character values, because we all have one. Character two is the emotion of me, the individual, my past, my fear of the future. This is my unhappy self. This is the part of me that is completely emotional dependent on what's going on in the external world, me in relationship to the external world. So yes, I'm happy, but I'm happy because the sun is shining and you and I, we want to go for a picnic and, and my little character too wants it to be sunny. And so if it's not sunny and it's raining, it's like my little character too is not very happy because I wanted to go on a picnic with JJ and now it's raining out. And then JJ jumps into her right brain and says, well, come on, little character too. Let's like go over here and we'll make a little picnic and we'll make it fun and it'll be good. And that's because you're in your right brain, little character three, happy and experiential in the present moment, aware, connected with other. And then character four is going to be this connection, this the peace and the elation and the, the gratitude that we feel simply because, oh my God, I'm alive. And all that other stuff going on in characters one, two, and three, well, they're busy, but, uh, you know, we meditate to get to character four. We pray to get to character four. We do mantras to get to character four, but we can jump into character four just by moving into our gratitude. You just so gave... Getting, 
Getting to know your choices. That's what, that's your power. So I always say that for me, uh, in order for me to get the, the biggest intuitive hits and downloads, I have to busy the rest of my brain. So in order for me to, so I'll go for a walk, like meditation is not going to get me downloads. Meditation is going to get me quieter and going to get me to attune to my breath and to the rate of my thoughts, my attachment to my thoughts, and then the allowing it to release. But I'm never going to get a huge download of inspiration when I'm meditating, when I'm exercising and I've got music in my ears and I'm by myself, I get the strongest clarity and intuitive hits because all the rest of me is busy. So we can't get in the way. That's right. That's exactly right. And and what you said first in my language is I cannot character one myself into my character four. I can't do it. Uh, It's the hustle. That is the hustle of life. Okay, well, I'm going to do all these things right, right? I'm going to meditate. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to have on the right outfit. I'm going to be around the right people. I'm going to be in the right place. And then I'm going to find my peaceful bliss. And it's like, no, you cannot hustle yourself to character four. You have to get into your body. And so when you're moving, you're in your body. It's, it's we have, we can only focus as a human. We can only focus our minds on one thing at a time, believe it or not. There there's all kinds of static going on in other parts of the brain, but we can only truly focus on one part of the brain. So as one thing, so as you get into your body and you're in the movement of your body automatically, you can tell the difference between a left brain dancer and a right brain dancer, right? The right brain dancer, they just dance. They don't care. There's no right, wrong, and no good and bad. The left brain, every little move is going to be just perfectly, you know, and it's like, and then they're going to be mad at themselves because, oh, I didn't do that well, or either that, or they're just going to like wiggle the head, you know, and the body just kind of like is there because they're all about a head being carried around by a body. So you're absolutely right. You're not, you're not faking yourself out. And so many of us are, we're just trying to fake ourselves out. Well, I think it's the fear, you know, and and I want to go back to, because I think I, in my mind, when I was assessing sort of your story, when I, when you, when you were first recovering and the light hurt your eyes and people were asking you over and over again <laughs> to tell you the story. Um, and you were just telling yourself, can you just be kind to me? Just be kind to me. I need right. you to be kind to me. Was that like an amygdala response of fight and flight of you're safe. You're not safe. Do you think that was because later in the book, you talk about how you recognize that no one's responsible for how you feel, right? There's this sort of prefrontal cortex consciousness of being able to observe a situation and know your responsibility in it versus it felt like amygdala, fight or flight, survival, you are safe, you're not unsafe, like asking for care Right. In a way that could sound, and again, I'm not, I'm trying not to judge it, but like to be, you know, oh, you need, all need to do what I want you to do. But in that moment in time, would, yeah. was that, would that be correct that your amygdala was the one really kind of saying, oh, you're safe or not safe. I just need like bringing it down to sort of a simple need. Well, it was, well, it's, first of all, I was so in the present moment. I lost the left hemisphere. So I lost Joe Bolte Taylor. I lost my past. I lost my future. I lost all my education. I lost all of that. That was gone. So all I had was right here, right now. Well, the nurses who came in to me, they weren't about right here, right now. They had their busy schedule and they had things that they need to, needed to do. And I'm on the list and they need to put my food down there. And then they fed me, right? That counts as feed and Jill cross that off the list. And here's our medication and then cross that off the list. And in the meantime, I'm, I'm here. I'm, a, I'm with God. I'm sitting, I'm big as the universe, right? And this warm body comes in as an energy form and, and they're either attracting my energy or they're repelling me. They're either a, a trying to have eye contact, trying to be gentle with me, trying to connect with me, or I've got a better alternative. I got God. You know, so why would I give you any energy or any focus or any attention, whether you're my PT, whether you're my surgeon, whether you're feeding me anything, you either attract me or you repel me because you don't feel like a safe thing. Now, that's very different than my amygdala saying uh, things based on my past experience or my future experience. So that was all shut down. But what I did have was the present moment 
everything's energy. When you don't have the division of self from every, from energy, all I am is an energy ball. I'm a big energy ball. You're a big energy ball. And it doesn't matter where in the world you are. Our energy is all one big energy ball, right? And then we have this group of cells in our left brain that says, no, this is where I begin and where I end at the, at the skin. And so now this is what I call me, the individual, and you're separate from me. And then we do this left brain dance with one another with language to communicate because we're no longer tele telepathically communicating that we're safe with one another. Did you know that before the stroke? Uh, no, I didn't know that. I had read a lot, but so, so the beauty of what my stroke of insight, what this experience happened as a brain scientist at Harvard trained in brain and at a cellular level to lose half of the brain was to really clearly define, you know, you can read in a book, okay, uh, these are the things the right brain does. These are the things that the left brain does, but it cannot tell you what does that experience feel like. And if you haven't had that experience, then how do I describe it in a way that helps you recognize when you're already there, when you're already doing it? So it's not about teaching people people from my perspective, how to get into their right brain. It's about recognize when you're already in it. Remember what that feels like and then attract the whole, let your whole energy shift back into that energy. You know that you're very different when you're standing on stage talking to an audience or you're on the phone coaching somebody. You're very different than when you're out standing on the beach and your heart becomes at one with the colors of that sun as it melts down onto the water and you just feel the the expansiveness of your soul. Those are completely different parts of your brain. And you can train yourself to know, okay, what do these parts do? What do they feel like? Give them a, they have a personality already, recognize that. And then once you start recognizing those characters in you, you're going to start recognizing them in your partner. And you're going to realize, oh, my partner's in a character one. So, you know, I need to respect what that need is. What do they value in that moment? And if I'm off in my three, then it's like, I need to go do my, th my three thing, leave them alone and let them do their thing. And then they'll come around to the three if and when they're ready. But allowing and honoring these four characters in other people. And then when we hook into that little character too, that is all about my relationship with circumstances and the judgment of right and wrong and good and bad and what is safe and what is not safe, alarm, alarm, alarm alert, alert. If I get triggered as that character too, how do you then choose to interact with my character too in order to help calm me down? And right now, our politically, we have given ourselves permission to be our meanest, worst character twos out in public. And it's fascinating. Fascinating is a word choice. Um, it, yes, <laughs> fascinating is a is a politically correct uh, word choice of, and one option of how to look at it. Uh, I will say, you know, we, we, could all, we could take any point of view here, any perspective. Um. Exactly. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, a part of us has gone publicly mad because we have. Yeah, right. Well, and, and again, there's this, the one side is for some people, it, well, that, that's a whole, to me, a soul level that's conversation. A and soul. It has a whole other conversation. Yeah. But, but what I have, and this has been my experience and my, I guess, opinion based on what, the, I, you know, my studies of people that I've been worked with over, and myself, like on the walk today, I said to Doug, I had a client on Monday who, who I felt it was probably, and, and I was reading your book at the time, but I really felt the distinction. I know I've been doing this and I haven't owned it for a while. I channel, but I don't own that because it just feels like a flow. It just feels just, I don't pre-think it. I don't pre-figure it out. It just comes, I say, and I'm like, oh, that's good. That's really good. <laughs> like after the fact, but what was happening is I had this client on Monday who I literally like nothing she had in front of me gave me the answer. I just got the answer. I got like, I had all the feelings. I had all the pictures. I had the expansive thing. And then my left brain, if I think, could organize it into what to do with that and how to take that information. But it was literally, and I do, I am very intuitive and I always do use it. 
but it's now I feel like I've gotten both sides to the point where they blend together. And I feel like the people that don't recognize and honor that right part of their brain and, and that don't feel comfortable there and that don't honor at any level and stay in their right, in their left brain are the ones that suffer more, even though that the yeah, right brain is exactly. very expensive, they suffer more. And exactly. it's, and I, and I'm, so I have all the, you know, cause I am a type A personality, but type A personality with balance. Like I, my right. whole thing is you about balance. The, you got it all going on. You got all your characters online. And wanting people to move into, but I find that I attract, of course, the ones that are very analytical and a, right, and they're, they're, they're holding tight to their, to their doing and their being a coup yeah. that like to their ego yeah. part of them. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, we have to move you over here. Right. Because this is the this is the truth too, and this right. is a truth that feels better. And it's like right. when you're talking about nirvana and yeah. feeling and feeling fluid, and I was like, yeah. oh, why did it's, you come back? Yeah. I mean, time to breathe. Yeah. Well, that's why I said to you right off the bat that I I like who you are because you encourage people and teach people, share with people how to self soothe. And true self soothing is allowing all the ego, you know, the ego is not going anywhere. And you can say to your ego, okay, I'm going to quiet you and just set you right over here. But you can come online anytime you feel the need. Don't worry, we're not going to kill you or hurt you in any way. But we're not going to focus the energy on that. We're going to focus the energy on me as I relate to the bigger picture. Because our genius, our in ingenuity, our innovation, our creativity, our intuition, all of that, we have to get out of the strict strict structure of me and what is right and what is wrong and what is good and what is bad and how am I going to be rewarded or how am I going to be punished if I get it right or I don't get it right or not. Nah, 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 nah. So you're helping helping people then shift from the pain. And that is the suffering. It is the suffering. Suffering is, is a, when reality doesn't match uh, our perception of what we want reality to be. It's pretty much that simple. And the left brain comes in with a preconceived notion about what it wants reality to be. I want this to happen. I want that person to be my mate. I want this. I want my child to be able to play the piano by the time they're three. I want this. I want that. I want all these things. And then when that doesn't happen, I suffer because I'm in this fine box of right and wrong and good and bad. Well, who doesn't need a break from the box of right and wrong and good and bad? You know, I just need to be real. What is reality? What is really in the present moment? Okay, my kids better at this than they are at that. This kid is better at this than they are at that. I'm better at this than I am at that. That's the reality. I'm okay with it. That doesn't mean, and because I'm okay with it, I allow myself to, to reset where I am and then step forward to a new space space of growth. And the left brain's not growing. The right brain is when the dendrites are all saying, oh, yeah, creativity, curiosity, innovation. Let's do this. Let's try that. Oh, failure. There is no failure. There's just a try and a learning from the try as opposed to the box of right and wrong and good and bad success and failure of the left brain. Did you, I know, yeah, I know you're a Taurus, uh, 14th. May 4. May 4. Okay. May the up. force be with you. Turns God. out to be me. <laughs> Um, I like, I feel, uh, uh, do you know your chart, by the way, I do astrology. Do you know anything else about your astrological chart? Out of you know a thing or two, cause uh, I don't know if you know Deb Silverman, but Deb Silverman is, uh, uh quite, uh, an entertainer and uh, psychologist and she does charts. And so she's actually done a chart on my original birth date and then my rebirth date from the morning of the stroke. Um, and that's actually, it's very interesting. I'll send you a link. We're going to have a conversation about exactly that on like Saturday. That is uh, very fascinating. Online. Yeah, it's really very interesting. And then if you throw in there also the date of my brother who's diagnosed with schizophrenia, you know, the only reason I grew up to study the brain is because his brain was so different from my brain. And so I had this differentiation as a child between, well, I didn't define anything as right and wrong and good and bad, but that was different from what I was perceiving. So how can that possibly be? What are we as biological creatures and how could we have the exact same experience, but walk away with complete different interpretations about what happened? And I would love to look 
further into the brain reasons, I, from like so far up till now, look at that as a frequency, um, frequency and vibration. And all. I, I've had the experience, I still keep having the experience where you see the same experience that someone's going through and, they're, and they have a whole story, they have a whole reality that's going on in their head that has nothing to do with what you're seeing. It doesn't make it wrong. It just makes no. it different. And half the time it's like, it's on a different frequency. And I've noticed yeah. that with many things. It made frequency as I was studying law of attraction and I understood the concept, but just like I I actually was in it. I'm like, oh, that's what this is. You just interpreted all of these things, had all of these feelings. And I don't think you're wrong, but I had none of that. I had a whole different experience, saw very different things, felt very different things. Right. And I was like, oh, right. that's what frequency, that's right. the power of, of understanding that. And I'm sure, again, there is the connections right. with, the, with the brain. Well, from, yeah, from your perspective, though, you're younger than I am. So, so in my day and age of growing up to be a scientist, I could look at it from a cellular perspective and say, what is the anatomical difference in the way information is being processed at a cellular level and still be acceptable in the you know, scientific community? But the two things that were completely taboo in my day was we couldn't talk about energy unless you're talking about the mitochondrial cell of, you know, the the mitochondria of the cell and the energy machine of the mitochondria and consciousness. I mean, we all went into neuroscience because we're fascinated with consciousness, but the only way we we can really have those conversations is around the lunch table. Nobody's going to publish about that, right? And so give it another 20 years, though. And now these conversations, it's easy now. Yeah, we can talk about quantum physics. We can talk about energy. We can talk about frequency and vibration and bring it all on, you know, because now it's uh, now it's all fair game. Which is exciting for me, exciting. Uh, and I'm sure exciting for you, especially when you went in in the way that you went in, and then you had to learn again. Same thing with you know with Eben and asking him about where he was versus where he is now, right? His sort of resistance uh, to yours wasn't resistance. Yours was just inquisitiveness. His was resistance to certain things and saying, no, 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 you're just delusional. You're not actually experiencing that. I can tell you why. But for you, how would you describe? the clear, like the things that you left behind. So throughout the book, you talk about how you, everything is lost. Jill is gone. And who is this new me? And who is this new person? Who do I want to be? So what would be if, if people were to meet you now who knew you before, what would be some of the clear differences that they would be able to say? Well, the biggest difference is um, uh, that I'm, I'm much more available um, and, and present and, open to what to to what is i'm friendlier boil it down to i'm friendlier um when i used to be a scientist at harvard and i had the schedule and i ran the schedule and i did the teaching and i did the research and i did the this and i was singing for brains because there's a shortage of brains donated for the research i was doing um i was making i was out being a force making things happen and I was, uh, I was very successful. I was climbing the Harvard ladder. I was having a marvelous life, a marvelous time. I was 37 in my prime. And then boom, that's gone. Um, and now I, for example, I've written this, this book, Whole Brain Living. And then I said to my publisher, okay, I'm going to go just, you know, do whatever I want to do for a couple of months and see what happens. Instead of forcing it, and I did do over 100 podcasts, so it's not like I didn't do the duty of, you know, planting a million seeds like a farmer would, but that's what I'm doing. And now I'm allowing the attraction. What am I attracting? And so now I'm attracting all of these people who are running these not-for-profits and these foundations and saying, you know, we just got 25 5,000 uh, yoga mats in the prisons. And now we want to follow that with whole brain living. We want to get whole brain living to that population. I've got someone doing um, rehabilitation and AA because character two is where that, that craving tissue is. So w- we can understand our, our addictions as it relates to the brain. And it turns out that, that the 12-step program of AA is identical to the hero's journey 
at the level of the brain. Well, that's a better framing, in my opinion. You know, I'd rather, I, I'm on the hero's journey. And aren't we all, if we're born, we're on the hero's journey. But it's a journey inside of the these four characters inside of our brain. Supposedly, three of them are unconscious. They don't have to be. We can now make characters two, three, and four very conscious so that we can consciously choose to be in that. So the biggest difference between pre-stroke and post-stroke Jill is um, I'm here. I am this enormous ball of energy and I attract, I'm attracting. Instead of forcing, I've become, I've really truly owned my own power. And now it's like, how do I play with others? How do I bring the best of myself and, and, bring, and in doing so, make your light brighter as well as you make my light brighter, you know? So um, it's just a completely sh different shift in mentality. Cool. Well, I can tell by, <laughs> well, well, I mean, even just, well, <laughs> it is, isn't it? It's so totally cool. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, it, it's the, you know, it, yeah. That's why I said in the, in, in my stroke of insight, you know, if I could wake up, and have that stroke or not have that stroke. I mean, I lost everything. The, you know, pre-Jill was pretty, pretty amazing. She was climbing the Harvard ladder. She was doing these amazing things. The work on schizophrenia and the, how does our brain create reality? The lab work, it was innovative and creative. It was phenomenal. I apologize for that, but I'm not going to go do anything about it. If you hear that in the background. Is that okay? So, um, so she was doing her thing. It was amazing. But boy, if I could wake up that day again on December 10, 1996 and have that stroke or not have that stroke, I'd have that stroke in a minute, man. It was painful. It was amazing. It was physiologically completely shifted my entire world to what it was supposed to be. Uh, I don't know if you know Abraham, but the one there's a very, uh, I'm going to say it, it's not the most famous quote because I say all the quotes, but here's my favorite quote. Uh, and it's the reason why you would choose to have the stroke again is that the only reason we want what we want is because we think we'll feel better when we have it. And that to me is all you need to know. The only reason we want anything is because we think we'll feel better when we have it. Do you need any more than that? The only reason any, anybody does anything. So that's when you, when you skip to the end, why am I doing this? I'm doing this to get money. So then what? So that I can have a house. So then what? So right. I can feel secure. So then what? So right. I can feel calm. So I can feel better. Right. So I can feel happy. Right. Okay. Get right. to happy now. Cause that's all you right. want anyway. And you don't need right. anything in between. Right. Yeah. That's the point. And then it's, how do you live that? That's right. And, and how do we integrate that? Because part of, I think some of the scholars that I've heard about talk about um, the plasticity of the brain and neural reprogramming and, and, I, would do, and I do EFT with clients. And it, it's that sometimes people talk about it who, who seem like they don't actually live it. So it's, this, it's a very left brain, right, yeah, explanation. Right, it's the hustle. Back to but the I, hustle. But I'm not like seeing the connection to right. the other side. Okay, here's how we change the plastic. Right. Here's how we change right. our programming. Right. But are you in that other side yet? Where is that part of you? Right. And that's kind of where I'm interested in without geeking out over too much of the brain science that I may or may not need to know. How do we shortcut and just get there? Right. And that's why I wrote Whole Brain Living, because Whole Brain Living, when you know, when you can, if you don't have two legs, then you're going to flop around, right? You're not going to walk. And there's this moment, this amazing moment in a baby's brain when it realizes, oh, I got two of those and I can work them independently. Differentiation happened because there was a refinement in the neuroplasticity of which cells were communicating with which other cells for me to be able to say, oh my gosh, I have two legs instead of one. Or, you know, you can watch when a baby in a crib finally realizes, Oh my gosh, that's me. I, I can control that thing. That's differentiation and refinement. So why would we think when we're 20 or 40 or 80 that we're completely refined and differentiated? There's always more learning to happen. So by learning about these four characters, and then it becomes, well, what happens if my character one has a value? And it's like, yeah, I want to move to New York and, and get a job there. And because I'll make more money and, and I'll raise my status in the world and my house will be and, and blah, 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 blah. But my right brain is saying, or my character three or four are saying, yeah, but my kids, 
my kids are really happy where they are. And right now they're thriving. And so I know I can't move them to New York and, and up, you know, it, it's just going to be a true, I have to pick. Well, what's that about? That's about a character one has these values and lives my life as this part of who I am. And I go be that. But then I have this other part of me that is also just as real. So how do I negotiate between these different parts? And so there's this conversation that happens. I call it the brain huddle, B-R-A-I-N. And when you do that, it brings your brain into the present moment. You've got all four characters online and they're actually communicating with one another. And once you got all your parts in agreement on what, how are we going to navigate the next step, the next step, the next step, that's how we find peace in our lives because we're actually not denying a part of who I am. We are loving all of us. And we're in a real understanding, open communication between these different values that the different parts of our brain have. And then it's a life of peace. So I guess part two um, will be whole brain living, where we're going to go through the different characters uh, a little bit more, maybe, and talk about that yeah. book. Sorry, everybody. Um, we can't do it today. I uh, didn't realize that. So, so we're going to have to do it again, and we're going to have to be part two. But going back yeah. to my stroke of insight, yeah. I think that if you haven't read the book or yeah. listened to the book, and I do love that you read it. Thank you. I'm tired of authors not reading their own books. Um, <laughs> Cause especially if I know them and I'm like expecting yeah. their voice and then it's not them, I get kicked out. I'm like, I can't, I know, it's <laughs> like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I can't, I can't, I'd rather read the book then if I, and then listen to it. But uh, Jill reads her own book, a brain scientist, personal journey, my stroke of insight. I would love, do you have one of your, I should have asked you this beforehand, one of your glass uh, brains anywhere near you? I do. Yeah. You want me to like, like run you there? I would love to, if okay. it's not, too, if it's not too much. Nope. Now I'm just going to run you around the house. And uh, I actually have, I have a pro for-profit and a not-for-profit business. And so I actually have a for-profit and not-for-profit brain. They're almost the same, but you know how logo and brandings are They're They're different. So, so here's, here's a brain. There's a stained glass brain right there. <sighs> Okay. Yeah. 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 And here's another one, which you might be able to see through there. Can you see yep. that? One there? Yep. And then this is my Starship Enterprise one. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. I have a very colorful house, as you can see, but I yes. do these sculptures down here uh -huh. and I do the sculptures. They're very um, right brain. So I don't know who's in there. All I know is someone is in there. And then <laughs> I... And then I go and dig them out like Michelangelo. It's really a beautiful process. Did you do any of this art before the stroke? Um, not at this level. No, no. I did art, but not at this level. No. On the cover of My Stroke of Insight, for those of you that are listening and aren't watching and don't have the book, uh, Jill, one of your ways of therapy was to make this glass uh, right. brain. And I think there's one somewhere on display at a hospital or a research center. Yeah, or there's one at NIH. There's one at the Harvard Brain Bank. There's one at a neurosurgeon's office in Knoxville. There's one in, I don't know, they're around the world, you know, stained glass brains, you know, why wouldn't I do that? <laughs> well, they're beautiful. Well, it, well, cause until you explained it, I yeah. mean, I, I could tell it was a brain, but it gave more yeah. significance, all, obviously, when yeah. I heard uh, yeah. when you were doing it and why. So um, please, everybody, my stroke of insight, if you know anyone who deals with one of the things that came to me, my grandmother has dementia. And I know it's not the same, but it's a brain yeah. uh, issue. And it also gave me compassion, not that I, again, the intuitive part of me wouldn't go to somebody who is non-responsive and, and have right. an energy of, you have to do what I want you to do. Or right. like, I wouldn't, I would not do that. Right. However, I know that happens. Right. And I think if people understood what might or might not be going on inside that person, there right. could be some compassion and some right. more gentleness of being right. When, yeah. when approaching patients who are going through whatever issues, stroke, dementia, Alzheimer's. Yeah. 
take responsibility. Please take responsibility for the energy you bring into any space at all. And if you don't know what that means, you need to know what that means because it has it makes all the impact. Go back to the energy and the frequency. If I'm walking in with the wrong frequency and you're in a mellow space and I'm in a high wire, we got to match somewhere along the line. We got to find our way to one another or we're going to have a horrible experience. And so if I'm sick and I'm scared and you come in and you're just in your fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it mode. I just maybe need you to hold me or connect with my energy or hear me. We all just need to be listened to and heard. And some of that isn't just what's coming out of our mouth. It's about the energy that we're in. And then you say, oh, but if you're in a funk, I want to get you out of your funk. And it's like, you know, if I just had a stroke, I might need you to be come and tell me, it's going to be okay. Yes, we're in a funk now and that's okay. We don't deny the reality, but we allow the reality to flow through us and flow out of us. Well, in the case of someone telling you to snap out of it, it's their discomfort with their own inner pain that you're reflecting yeah. back to them. Half the time when people want other people to stop crying or to get better, it's because right. you're uncomfortable, not because you you don't know how to, we don't know how to hold the space for people. That's people right. do not, we're quick to, oh, no, no, it's okay. Oh, no, no, don't cry. Yeah, don't like, cry, don't cry. It's like, no, I want to wail. It's like, yeah, wail. Let's allow wail yeah, allow them know. because that's part of the healing. That's part yeah. of the experience. And so- yeah. My Stroke of Insight, please everybody get it, read it, listen to it, uh, and then we'll be back for another conversation on Whole Brain Living. Uh, yes? I love it. Yeah, that was great. Thanks, JJ. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. I appreciate you being here. I can't wait to share this, and I can't wait for our next conversation, and I'm going to have to get the book today to get, so when we schedule, I have, I've already read that also. But I, So for any of you who've been interested in this, uh, again, please get My Stroke of Insight. I know it's Again, I'm late to the party, but I'm not. It's at the perfect time for all of you who will follow me to to get this information. It's now time to integrate this and get prepared for our next conversation. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Perfect. Thank you, dear.